Live from San Francisco, celebrating 10 years of high-tech coverage, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2019. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone. CUBE coverage here at VMworld 2019. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Dave, 10 years covering the CUBE. Lots changed. The game is still the same when it comes to storage, backup and recovery. Got some, and then some new stuff too, some great news. Two great guests, CUBE alumni, Shea Bolin, who's the Senior Vice President of Product Strategy at Rubrik. Chris Wall, Chief Technologist at Rubrik. Guys, welcome back to the Cube. Thanks. Good to be here. So the game always is getting better in terms of modernization. That's a big trend, digital transformation. Everyone talks about that, but the cloud impact has been something that you guys have been riding the wave on. You guys had great success. Um, I don't think you guys have been classified as a startup anymore. You get more in high growth mode. Um, so let's cover the news. What's happening with the, with the announcements here at VMworld? What's the big news? So we announced uh, our new release of uh, Andy's 5.1 and uh, really uh, breaking new ground and expanding our uh, position into new markets around data governance, uh, disaster recovery, and we're also bringing in uh, uh, continuous data protection as a core capability of our product. Uh, really excited about it. These are areas that have generally been addressed through sort of separate siloed approaches and we see a lot of synergy with backup recovery and uh, brought it all together as part of this offering. And how's the, how's the news going, going over? Oh, it's been great. I mean, if you look at data governance, uh, everyone's struggling today with privacy. How do you discover personally identifiable information in your backup archives? Very hard problem to solve. Uh, generally, people do spot audits and checks. We've just made that really easy, streamlined with the backup process. It sort of naturally fits there in some ways because I'm backing it up. Why not process that data to discover sensitive information and then classify it? And uh, our customers are really, really excited about that. Chris, talk about the architectural shifts because one of the things that we were observing in our opening uh, day analysis is, you know, storage is still a hot startup sector. I mean, storage is not storage anymore. It's evolved. We were even joking this morning with NVIDIA and Dell EMC guy around H uh, VDI. Mm -hmm. And that's not VDI anymore, it's user experience. So storage specifically with cloud has certainly changed changed, on-premises, everyone now recognizes hybrid, finally, as a standard, it's not going away. Mm -hmm. This, but the operating model is requiring a new architecture. You can't just take the old and recycle it into the new. We'll talk about what that is specifically and why it's important. Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of tie that back to what we're talking here with cloud data management. It's kind of this acknowledgement that the way we did IT back in the day where the storage food group was completely isolated, things went into it, things came out of it, but it wasn't part of that kind of overall architecture, especially when you start talking public cloud and whatnot. <laughs> that was just a kind of acknowledgement that this model of IT just isn't going to carry us forward. And that's similar to the process of let's take all this backup data with Rubrik, let's index it, inventory it, really start to understand what's going on, and use that as like the jet fuel that actually powers our Polaris platform and all of our data management applications. And I think that all starts with storage. We have to have that data out of primary into some secondary location, keep it very efficient, yeah. figure out how it's going to get from one place to the next, and that used to just be data centers. Now it's clouds and yeah. back and forth, so. It's funny, these sacred cow categories, you know, backup, recovery, DR, it's data. I mean, this is a data problem. It's exactly. data Data is value is in data. You're seeing platform kind of thinking coming in. We've talked Absolutely. about this in Palo Alto in our studio when yes, you came in. Yeah. It's a platform thing. It's not just you know this tool or siloed approach. This is absolutely. And that was you know when we spoke last. Uh, I had recently joined Rubrik back then. Our vision had always been. You know, this is high value data. Yes, we're going to build backup in a way that is quite revolutionary, but how do we create more leverage out of that data? And we're, we're starting to see uh, uh, actual execution to that, both with our radar uh, product, uh, ransomware recovery, sonar for data governance, orchestrated DR, uh, exposing more and more value out of that data, and it's really connecting. So I'd love to come back to the announcement, the Andy's uh, announcement. Yes. You talk about governance, DR, and, and, and CDP. You're right, these oftentimes would be point products, but explain to people sort of uh, the, 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 the before and the after that sure. you're trying to, when you walk into an account, you might see, like you say, different point products. How are they transitioning? Maybe you could add some color there. Yeah, absolutely. So with data governance, everybody's, everyone's got to deal with it today at some level. Uh, I use privacy as an example, but truly, we all are impacted. If you're in healthcare, you've got HIPAA. If you're dealing with financial data, you've got PCI. 
uh, generally the backup data has been somewhat of a black box. I, the only way to really check it is to do a sort of spot audit check. It's labor intensive and hard. We're streamlining that process for our customers and incorporating it as a value add on top of what they're doing with backup and uh, I think that's solving a major pain point. On DR, same thing, separate silo today, generally different product lines, but backing up core objects, VMs, databases, and application stacks, which is what you're really trying to do with a DR solution, you know, there's a lot of synergy there. And so we're helping to just bring that synergy together into this integrated platform approach. You guys are doing some machine learning. I saw in the news around classification, you mentioned it, indexing. It sounds like a search engine, but you know, again, to my point about these categories kind of being broken down, this platform. You guys are using um, machine learning to do some classification around protecting against breaches, is that right? Could you get, just drill down on that a little bit? What's that all about? Yeah, so we use machine learning in a variety of ways. In our radar product, our ransomware recovery product, we use it for anomaly detection of change patterns in the data uh, you know, ransomware attacks generally involve people coming in, updating, deleting, encrypting your data. We look at the changing profile of the data and alert on anomalous behavior, and then recover back to the less stable state. And with our data governance product, we're also using machine learning to discover that PII information and trying to really help uh, find a very, very rich, uh, uh, accurate way of detecting that So two that killer apps, one, ransomware, which big problem. I mean, you just, you can't look a day without seeing major ransomware. The Texas thing to me jumps out. Yeah. Coordinated attacks, I even speculate that's cybersecurity related. Some would say there's some you know, state actors on that or sanctioned groups doing that, but again, I'm a conspiracy theory on this one. But that's <laughs> ransomware killer app. Compliance, kind of a boring category, but super important because of the penalties. I yes. mean, compliance is, is an issue. Absolutely. Huge. I mean, you look at um, GDPR in Europe, uh, compliance policies here in this country across various verticals, everyone's dealing with it in some form or another. And um, you know, there's no reason why that should be a separate sort of uh, process. Why not leverage a data management uh, like what, what is yeah. being provided by Rubrik to deliver on that. Another question on DR. So one of the complaints that you hear, maybe not complaints, but observations when you talk to <laughs> practitioners is they can't test their DR. They can test the failover, but they can't test the fail back because it's, it's too on. risky. Yes. How do you address that problem? And you're all about you know, modern data management, simplicity, yes. um, cloud. Describe how you solve that problem. That's a very, very powerful question, Dave. And it's so true. Traditionally, customers that are using on-prem DR systems need to set up the infrastructure, the people, the processes. It's very labor intensive and expensive. So you can only do it a few times a year, max. And that's how you know that your DR system is operational. You don't want to discover that there's a problem when there's an actual DR happening. Our approach basically takes the full application stack that you want to protect, uh, we convert it for you into a cloud native format and we can instantiate any one of those snapshots that we're taking of that full application at any point in time in the cloud for you to verify and test and we streamline that process fully orchestrated. If you choose to keep it in the cloud, we have a cloud native approach to, to protect it and then you can fail back to your on-prem system. And so we've just streamlined this process in a way that really helps mm our customers do DR tests on a much more frequent basis without that uh, operational burden and challenge that they're dealing with today. Talk about, um, Chris, this rubric build open source initiative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I want, then it's interesting. First explain, take a minute to explain what is, what is rubric build, yeah. what's it all about? What's the philosophy behind it? I'll, I'll, take, you, I'll take you back a few years uh, when, when I was interested in joining rubric. The one major defining characteristic of the product that really tugged my heartstrings was a restful set of API endpoints for everything. Doesn't matter what the product does, anything you click, it's always calling a restful API. And that goes to a pain point that I had as a customer was automating, we'll say any kind of backup product, but a lot of things in the infrastructure space was like smashing my face against a hot iron. You know, it's just not pleasant. <laughs> it's bad visual too. Exactly, yeah. so I'm thinking. Like, I've okay. never tried that. <laughs> <laughs> do not do that at home. Uh, the analogies, that's my one gift to, to the world. But um, You need RESTful APIs. You do, you do. <laughs> yes. And so, finding a product that not only had them, but wanted you to consume them, made them available across every feature, click, whatever, that that existed was very, very powerful for me and a lot of other people that I work with. Fast forward a few years, we developed quite the library of different open source projects, 
for integrating with things like ServiceNow and vRealize and you know, anything that does things from configuration management all the way to infrastructure as code. And we would go talk to customers about these things. And you had two camps of people. Either I need the 100 level stuff I've never dealt with, CI CD pipelines, yeah. automation, unit tests, pull requests, what is GitHub, all the way through. I know all that stuff, give me the, give me the use cases. What can I do with your API? And so we wanted to develop Rubric Build as kind of a teach you how to make the champagne and teach you how to drink the champagne. Uh, so the idea is all of our software development kits, our ecosystem integrations, and our use cases are bundled into this very friendly ecosystem where it's all open source, we have quick start guides, educational uh, materials, and a number of folks that are on the engineering and marketing teams that are engaging with people that either don't care much about cloud data management and just want to learn kind of the, the automation DevOps world of things, or are very keen to learn more about CDP. So Rubrik like employees that. donating the code for open source. Did you guys create the project? Was it community driven or is it, how's it structured? It's kind of three slices. It could be from Rubrik, we built this thing like an SDK, we obviously own and support that. Yeah. It could be someone found our SDK and wanted to write a third party integration. Heck, even Microsoft wrote a System Center Ops Manager plugin and hosted on their GitHub site. Or kind of something in the middle where we're working with uh, like a Red Hat on their Ansible integration as an example. So what other kind of innovations have come out of that? You mentioned Microsoft doing the you know, GitHub. Other sort of things that have come out of it or things that you're hoping to come out of it? You know, we, it's hard we, to predict, I know. We've had the, uh, we've, like the predecessor of the DR pro product that we released or, or announced is, uh, was actually born in open source. Uh, many years really? ago I had a customer saying, I'd really like to be able to automatically do DR tests, like every night for these five critical apps, and we had the APIs, we have the ability to live mount workloads, we tie into the cloud, it's like, there's no reason we can't do this. And so we had that kind of bit more manual process, but it does the job years ago that we developed as a use case doing a couple different languages. Fast forward now, it's a product. So you can kind of get to see that evolution from idea to you know, sort of hacking on things to get them to work to now it's a full product and you can just push the button and you know, everyone's going to love that. So that's one Very example. Cool. Talk about the VMware relationship. What's the status? How long have you guys been working with VMware and the ecosystem? And what are some of the new things that are developing in the relationship? Yeah, I mean, we, this is a deep relationship. It's uh, been a critical one from the beginning of the company. And we, we integrate and support and are certified across a variety of solutions. Uh, obviously uh, uh, vCenter and, and, uh, and in this latest release uh, with our uh, continuous data protection, we've done that in a way that is a, a certified approved approach and, and I think that helps us really build the confidence and deliver the sort of excellent overall experience that our customers are looking for. And, the, and they got the open source aspect too, it's pretty hot right now with the cloud native stuff going on. Absolutely. It's pretty relevant. <laughs> All right, well we got to ask, yes. we, we gotta ask the multi-cloud everything here. What's your guys' point of view on multi-cloud? Um, real, BS, somewhere in the middle, time will tell. What's your thoughts? Definitely real. I'll add color. I mean, I think yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. absolutely are. <laughs> you know, we used to talk about hybrid uh, just a few years ago, uh, and that's still real too, but uh, we see a lot of customers looking at leveraging best in class for different workloads and different services across multiple clouds, and our vision is to be the data management platform of choice across all of that, enabling that choice and giving the excellent sort of cloud native experience that they're looking for as they deploy different workloads in these different so environments. So I'll just share with you, so we've been talking yes. on theCUBE a lot, a lot of, there's a lot of us believe this, this, that certain parts of multi-cloud are on the BS side. In other words, that vision that any app can run on any, anywhere without recompiling, without retesting, that's aspirational. Yes. And you're going to need a lot of homogeneous infrastructure to do that. The one area that I do think that you can standardize on is what you guys call data management or backup that you can actually say, okay, we're going to mandate that this is the platform that we're going to use across all clouds, and that actually will work, yes. technically. Yeah, right? Some of this other stuff I'm not so sure, but... but if you have a, a, you know, a control plane, if you will, with data management entities that live on-prem, as well as localities that are available across public cloud, then it's really just a choice of why do you want to put the data there? And we're driving that through our service level agreement domains, or SLA domains, where you can say, this data needs to live in Germany, it needs to be in this particular data center forever, or this one needs to replicate to, you know, between France and London, something like that. You can make those choices based on what you're trying to achieve more around non-technical decision making than actual technical decision making, which, which I think has really been kind of the, you call the, the BS versus no BS. It's like, are we trying to do this because we can or because there's yeah. actual <laughs> need to do something? And that's to me the decision between Well, yes and it's customer not. driven too. The use cases will drive it, for instance, a security requirement might be 
build our own stack, yeah. I want to be on this cloud, have a backup cloud, or the workload might have certain requirements. But again, I think the data question is a good one. You, you, that's going to be well, independent of. I, I, I want to test it with the, the technologists because if you have, let's say you have outposts and you got Azure Stack, you know, cloud a customer or whatever, and, and if you think you're going to run apps anywhere, and those, that's not going to happen anytime soon anyway. However, if, if I want a data management solution across all of those, I actually, that can work. Yeah. Right, there's no reason it can't because you'll write to their APIs. You'll and, you'll and take you're care of that. You're seeing that today with like Kubernetes deployments. They're not all the same, but they everybody's got an offering in there, and mm -hmm. everyone has a full suite of APIs that you can plug into. So I do agree that things like data management not only can but should be ubiquitous across yeah. localities. It shouldn't matter where you're at. The experience should be roughly the same. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not that disruptive to say, okay, rogue division, we're going to swap out and you're gonna, we're going to stand That's usually where the multi-cloud comes from. <laughs> it's kind of involuntary. You got two teams just chose different <laughs> right, things. Right, right. Well, we got the brain trust on the cube here. I want to pose another question for you. That, again, we're going to look at the videotape five years from now. We're going to see how it all turns <laughs> out. <laughs> so one of the things we've been kind of uh, talking about um, here on the cube and also leading up to VM world this year is Cloud 2.0, mainly around the following premise. Cloud 1.0 being defined as AWS, DevOps, Agile, Lean Startup, all that, all that stuff that was we all love in, in DevOps. Compute, storage, scale, all the goodness that came from that. Cloud 2.0 is more of an enterprise cloud kind of configuration. So with that kind of, where networking and security and data are now kind of in the architecture. So I want to ask you guys, if that's the premise, if Cloud 1.0 was DevOps, pure cloud native, born in the cloud, what's your definition of cloud 2.0? Because a lot of people are looking at it from like that simple lens, just trying to simplify that the requirements are changing, the architectures are different, the backup can work multi-cloud, but this can't. So there's a lot of moving parts now in this enterprise hybrid world. So what's your definition, guys, on how cloud 2.0? Well, you know, I think increasingly you're seeing the landscape of the infrastructures you pointed out evolving uh, the use of different services across clouds evolving. W what's really important is that uh, solutions like data protection don't limit your ability to capitalize on that in our minds. And so we, we want to build this ubiquitous sort of policy engine and governance around how to protect my assets and enable um, whether it's containerized application stacks that are being de delivered or new private cloud uh, deployments uh, that we are not getting in the way of that in any way at all and allowing our customers to sort of broaden and leverage best in class services. Chris, what's yeah. your definition of cloud 2.0? Uh, I'll take us back. I mean, we, we saw this with virtualization. We saw everybody go, oh my gosh, I can get all this capacity used and all these new services and just going bonkers. And that's where we had like zombie virtual machines and all these other terms that we don't really throw about anymore. But it was the wild west. Everyone was just land and expand. And we kind of did that with cloud in a lot of cases. You're like, oh, look at these new shinies that I can play with. And now you're absolutely right. It's what about role-based access control and user security and my S3 bucket got hijacked and ransomware is tearing through, like you can now ransomware video cameras and things like that. Yeah, it's, right. it's a pretty terrifying world. And I think this is that moment where we take a look back and say, well, is it highly available? Is it secure? Yeah. How do I know that? Am I able to recover from you know, availability or even external threat issues. And to me, that's where most of the conversation Yeah, it's the transformative are. opportunities is all intoxicating. Oh, this is great. Yeah. But the reality is it's not as clean as going to the cloud. Give the me something old, that you yeah, know will work. You know? I, I got to build the system out. It's an operating environment. Yeah. Yes. Totally agree. You guys are doing great. Thanks for the commentary and insight on cloud 2.0 awesome. and multi-cloud. And congratulations on your success at Rubrik. Thanks for coming on, sharing the insights. Cube coverage here at VMworld 2019. More after this short break.